Uh, it's my second. Uh, the first film was never released. It is a $12,000 black and white feature, which has me in it and my family, uh, my mother, my wife, my car. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, it was um, after five years of being out of work mm -hmm. and writing. After film school, is that right? It was in between, after film school, yeah. About uh, five years after film school, I was just like, I cannot wait for the phone to ring anymore. They won't let me fly the plane. I'm going to build my own airport. I had seen clerks. And I just thought, like, you know what? Very low expectations. At least I'll be doing something. Right. And, you know, nothing really happened with the film. It played in a couple of festivals. Mm -hmm. But I got a job right afterwards, completely coincidentally. And it was because it had changed me as a person. I was, like, less powerless and a little bit more, I uh, had a little bit more confidence and had shaken off some of the bitterness that can accrue as you, as you are, uh, as, after, as, after five years of rejection. Sure. It was about everything that was going on in my life. It was called, uh, it's called What Do You Do All Day? And uh, the funny thing is, is that um, it, it, uh, I recommend it highly because everybody can raise $12,000 mm -hmm. as an experience of if you're an aspiring filmmaker to, to actually start making something is just, uh, it, it, it changed everything. Well, there's really no other way to do it these days, is there? I mean, you must make something before anyone's going to hire you to Well, I mean, it. you know, there is the, the traditional route, which is you keep writing scripts and hope that you write one that people will buy and get bid on and become some kind of phenomenon. And uh, that, was, that was the theory then. And it's just, uh, what is it, Citizen Kane? And it, it, <laughs> there was a rumor that nurses were pretty. <laughs> it's just as true today as it was then. <laughs> Not true or whatever. It's a, it's a, it's, there are many, many ways. At, you know, if you start collecting people's stories, you talk to a lot of, uh, of artists, there's a million ways in. But uh, making something is the one, I think, that can really, that the getting your hands on the process, learning factor aside, honestly, one of the greatest advantages of Mad Men and working in TV is what you write gets shot. Mm -hmm. There is no way to learn more about writing than to see your stuff get shot. Mm -hmm. It's a, screen, a screenplay is a blueprint, yeah. you know? Well, what did you take out of that writer's room from Sobrano? Well, it, you know, the timeline is that I, I wrote the pilot for Mad Men when I was working in sitcom. Mm -hmm. And about two and a half years after that, I got, it got me my job on The Sopranos. And then I worked on The Sopranos for four and a half years and then got to make the pilot and then nine months after that, I wrote the second episode of Mad Men. Mm -hmm. So who knows what the show would have been like if I hadn't gotten to work there. It right. was that um, influential. First of all, The Sopranos, I, I wrote the pilot right when The Sopranos went on the air. They, I, I, I did not know it. But as soon as I saw it, I was like completely blown away and inspired and like could not believe that something could be that artistic and be a commercial success. Um, and uh, was so relevant, and like just seeing like a strip mall, and just things that had never been in a, in, a, in an American television or movies. Um, and I guess the thing that I learned was to uh, story is the last thing to come. Like I started off as a joke writer and learned how to write plots on on, on sitcoms from from people who really knew how to do it. And then the idea of story for David Chase. And I had very little to do with the story process. I was in the room and watched David. We, we gave ideas, but they, it would go through David and it would come out. Mm -hmm. I think that two things. One is David thought I was a good writer, and that changed my feelings entirely about, about writing, because um, you never know. <laughs> and um, and uh, the other thing was that I learned to trust my subconscious. And I think that when you meet the great artists in any field, mm -hmm. you will see them start to talk about what they do as if they've never done it. Mm -hmm. And they will treat all the problems. They don't say, like, well, this is the way you solve that thing. You go, blah, 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 blah. That's what you want them to say. Like, oh, please tell me. Like, you've done this a million times. You've written 5,000 scenes with two people walking into a room together. Like, how does it work? But they approach it like it's new every time. Mm -hmm. And you're like, where does that come from? And the idea that if something is on your mind, it's worth saying. Mm -hmm. If something really happened to you or seems related to, to life in any way, a dream, I don't mean just like using dreams in, in the story. I mean, you have to trust the idea that, that what's on your mind is the story.
right. and that the specifics of it are going to be universal. I, and David was completely confident in that, and it, it changed the way I, I started writing much more. I was always interested in psychology, and the Mad Men pilot had a lot of psychology in it, but I was always sort of um, writing from the outside in a little bit, a little bit embarrassed about what was really going on in my mind. And when I got to The Sopranos, I'm like, oh my god, this is where the gold is. This is the part that people come up to you out of nowhere, and you, you write some line. And most of the lines that people come up to me with The Sopranos and say, I love it, are, are David's. Right. It was rewritten heavily <laughs> as our writers on every show. I hope you take credit anyway. Uh, no, I you. don't. Thank you very much. I don't. Um, but, um, you know, I just remember the first time I had some line in there where where Janice Soprano says to uh, Bacala's kid when, when they're living together, they're married. She says, uh, he's going out, and she goes, well, why don't you go upstairs and get your Spanish, get, uh, have you done your Spanish? Why don't you go upstairs and get your report card and come down and read it to everybody? And he like, hangs his head and goes up. And I had so many people come to me, and I was like, I didn't know what to write. I just wrote what my mom always said. <laughs> and you're like, oh my god, that's valuable. I like that idea of the subconscious, especially because creating a universal, being a universal, because we're yeah. not all that unique, clearly, right? We're not, we're not unique. Which is a shame, but also... It's amazing, because we feel, I think, uniqueness is, uh, I know that there's the triumph of, like, I am a very special person, and I'm one of a kind. Um, my best friend is, has a twin, and I always say to him, I was like, there's only one of me. <laughs> Um, but, uh, which is great, because everyone always says to him, I wish I was a twin. Um, but you, how, how incredible it is that, that, that we are related to each other in that way, that children all over the world tease each other by saying, nah, 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 nah. It's like, that's like hardwired, apparently, you know? That's, that, to me, makes me feel less alone, which I think is what entertainment is about, too. Well, this is a comedy, or at least it, it's, it's, it's hard to categorize because yeah. it begins as what you, begin, you think it's going to be something of a stoner comedy, right. right? but then it really evolves into this story of friendship and devolution of self and yes. whatnot. I, tell me, you started this script many, many years ago. Yes, I actually, in that timeline I told you, um, this was the next thing I wrote other than The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. and. I guess Becker and Andy Richter controls the universe. This was the next thing I wrote for myself mm -hmm. after the Mad Men pilot mm -hmm. and before I got to do the show. And um, I had that, that line came to me because I was thinking about where I was in my life and, you know, happily married and like children and my wife is my best friend, but I, a lot of my friends weren't married yet and we had just completely, as you do, drifted apart. And some of them were still in a different phase of their life. And I just said, like, well, and, and you go to the movies and TV, and Steve says it. That was the first line that I had of it was, friendship is a lot rarer than love because there's nothing in it for anybody. Mm -hmm. The idea that you pick somebody and they're part of your life and, you know, you do everything to get, I mean, there was a guy that I sort of know who had a, a genetic predisposition for uh, um, a certain kind of cancer and he had to go in and get a test. And it was mentioned sort of in passing at work. And I called him. He did it on a, on a Monday. And I called him Monday night. And I said, how'd it go? And he said, you know what? Everything's fine. I can't believe you called me. You are really my friend. Hmm. And I said, if I was your friend, I would have gone with you. And that's the thing. There was someone in my life that I went everywhere with that was. So you're like, well, what happened? And I used to have a line on the front of the script during the many years that I was uh, trying to get it made. Mm -hmm. Some of it is not all about how hard it is to make any film. Right. Some of it I was busy with the show and people were, what do you want to do? Okay, we'd love to do this. When can you do it? And I couldn't. Right. Um, but there's a line on the, uh, that I used to put on the script from All the King's Men where uh, I think Tiny said, or it said about Tiny, he says, uh, the only true friend is the friend of your childhood because he does not even see you. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, like, that is interesting. What if these guys, what if these two characters, and obviously there's a lot of things in here about mental illness and our relationship to nature, and our, you know, I love this character, starting with uh, playing, to some degree, I wrote it for Owen, playing with Owen's persona of this, you know, anti-authoritarian, you know, uh, um, you know, kind of slacker, womanizer, drinker. Um, but to me, he's a character who's unable to feel. Mm -hmm. And you're going to find that out over the course of the movie. 
And so I like the idea of trying to say, you know, you are here. Is there a way to get to the moment of being in the moment? And why are we so afraid of that? And why are we trying to anesthetize ourselves from it? And when you get in that moment, the incredible thing is there's, this, there's gratitude for very simple things, which is friendship is not simple. It is spectacular. And uh, that was kind of what I was trying to say. It's like, okay, so, so we're going to have to grow up. So we're going to have to accept the compromise of the fact that mental illness is, is, is controllable, but it's, it's going to be a different existence. It's going to be a less intense, less exciting, somewhat more regular existence. Which, and sobriety is going to be a more regular existence. That's going to be adulthood. Why, why maturing? Why, why even live? And Zach says it, you know. This is, we are lucky to be here. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I guess it's a more, a slightly more cheerful uh, message than you get from Mad Men a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really wanted to, t uh, it's, it's important to me. I wanted to tell that story because I feel like the world is extremely alienating right now. And I feel like we live in, uh, in places that are too ugly for us, that we, that we deserve better. I feel like technology and, hell, I love my phone. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not a vegetarian either. But I feel like our distance from the food supply, from nature, our inability to even tell when it's going to rain, is, um, it's, bad for, it's bad for us as human beings, and it, it makes us lonelier. And um, I want to say like something about that. Well, thematically, as different as this is from Mad Men, <coughs> we were just saying outside that, Thematically, this feels very of, of, of one voice to Mad Men, which is about people who are alienated from the, the society that they've built, these products that Don Draper sells. Right, right. Also, similarly, kind of anesthetize themselves with alcohol, with drugs, with sure. sex, with all these things. It's, it's interesting to have uh, one controlling thought, in a way, between these two disparate works. Uh, you know, honestly, some of it for me is just like, I know these people. And I don't know how many people here have someone like Zach in their life or are that person in someone else's life. Um, you know, Amy is polar is playing the adult. Uh, Laura Ramsey's character, Angela, you do find out that she is also another flawed person. That she, you know, she sleeps with Zach and it certainly is, it is an act of kindness and generosity, but it's really messed up. <laughs> and her husband did just die. And you start to say like, I think there's something wrong with her. And guess what? There's something wrong with everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that it has the most in common, or if I have a take on things, is I won't say that I'm accepting of human frailty, but I try not to judge characters. And you get these people good and bad, and they are trying to do their best. And for me, there was a pleasure in seeing like Owen and Zach's characters change places. Mm -hmm. And just kind of like, reveling whether it's part of story as a revelation or just you know entertainment in the fact that these are flawed people how do you find you know you don't see a lot of them in the movies i, I mean I, I really i told you this earlier i mean i'm a huge admirer of movies of the early 70s i love hal ashby i love uh five easy pieces which this is very closely related to whether you can tell or not i, mean, I don't know how recently anyone's seen that but um I just like the reality of like the human condition and not, it's not like I'm against comic book movies or formula in any way, but I feel like we have a right to see people that we recognize in the movies sometimes. Well, something that you certainly do in Mad Men and that was in Sopranos as well, and here, of the not judging and just putting someone up and letting your audience read right. them as they will. Yes. It's a tightrope. It's a high risk proposition. And I think that you will see whether you enjoy the movie or not, that it will stick with you. And that you will see it somewhere. And I think the experience is very first person. But it was a revelation to me <coughs> that people approach their entertainment with a desire to feel superior. I didn't know that. I, I'm probably like this too. What an idiot. What is that guy doing? Oh, I can't believe he's doing that. I kind of approach it with like, I like not knowing. Tell me the story. 
I've never heard the story before. You never know. It's part of the genre thing, too. You never know what's going to happen in this movie. That was a tremendous amount of effort to basically make it look like it's going to be a legal battle and then have it over in a second. This isn't an easily categorizable. I know, I know. You can't say it's a thriller. It's a is that good or bad? I don't know. I mean, for me, it it was really hard to do. I think there was a time when there were a lot more movies like this. Um, You know, I'm mystified by genre. I'm just going to say it. Mad Men doesn't have a genre. I mean, I know the difference between drama and comedy, but who knows if there was only two hours of Mad Men, what you would qualify it as? You know, I don't know. There's a lot. Is it a thriller? Is it like film noir? Is it I mean, there are definitely comic ones. It's black comedy sometimes. I, I don't know. It's a mystery. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know why you have to do that. Right. But then there's part of you that says, like, especially depending on, I think it changes historically what people are in the mood for. And sometimes, especially when we're adrift the way we are right now, sometimes people want to go and explore that. And sometimes they just want to escape. You just want to say, like, give me the world with order. Tell me who's good. Tell me who's bad. People who die are brought back to life. Um, that's where we are right now. And I, I get it. Believe me, I'm living here, too. Yeah. Do you think Mad Men came of a particular moment where we were? I guess it must have because it hit a nerve. I, I was not. Oh, I, I mean, you heard how long it took to get made. If it, had, if it, if it came in a moment, it was really just lucky. <laughs> Um, I mean, it certainly came in a, in, a, in a moment in business where some someone like AMC that you know most of you would have called A and E or something <laughs> went on the air that you wouldn't you would they they were willing to take a risk and um, I think that the period was unknown. I think it has an inherent uh, attraction because this was like one of the most successful periods of design, and it was America at the very, very top. 1960, New York City. New York City is bankrupt by 1977, but in 1960, the period between World War II and so forth, New York is the center of publishing, advertising, theater, film, believe it or not, because all the film companies are here, even though everything's being shot out in Hollywood. Finance, fashion, uh, you know, intellectuals, art, and then something happens. And I think maybe we were in a moment. It's weird because, you know, when Obama got elected, I thought, well, no one's going to watch the show now. And it's like, it's, the, the, all the irony's gone. But it turned out, it was, turned out, you know, I think I started the show thinking it was going to be time for a critique, especially of, of the baby boomers. Uh, and their, what, what I, growing up in the Reagan era, what I saw as their lack of, commitment to their ideals. Um, and I'm the next generation, so like, I mean, I'm, it's my job to, to have a problem with it. But uh-huh. when I started doing the show and started looking at America in that, you know, in that period, I was, I was more and more convinced of like, I guess saying America's in decline is a very old thing to say. It goes back to the colonies. It's part of our self-criticism. And I kind of felt like a guy like Don Draper who's in, somehow has the same genetic material as Rockefeller and Lee Iacocca and Sam Walton and Bill Clinton, you know, that, and, and Barack Obama, you know, and a lot of women, as I've learned over the course of the show, um, famous and not, who've made an impact on the, on the society. I was like, this is obviously an amazing place. Actual social mobility. Mm-hmm. The ability to invent yourself and not be held accountable at all some of which was derived from an experience of working on a sitcom and working with a guy who was telling everybody how he went to Harvard and someone finding out and confronting him and him getting caught and nobody caring. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's like, you know what, good for him. He obviously opened some doors. Well, so this idea of inventing yourself, I, we talked a little bit uh, when we were outside about having, uh, in Mad Men, unknown actors for the most part, or at least not familiar faces. Yes, and which power. was his strategy, yeah. Right. And the power of that, and you have this blank canvas, and then as opposed to are you here, where you have Zach Galifianakis, you know, Amy Poehler, you've got Owen Wilson, yeah, uh, people who carry baggage. And by the way, them. Laura Ramsey, who played Angela, I had an opportunity to cast more well-known, famous people than people than her, and I made the decision that for the for the purposes of the narrative, 
that I didn't want you to know her very well. I wanted you to be worried that she was full of it. I wanted the tension. I wanted mystery. Mm -hmm. And I wanted the mystery which is being projected on her mm -hmm. by the other characters. Mm -hmm. um, so how and else do you use them? I mean, because most filmmakers... It's a funny thing. I mean, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, uh, I did not write that. Um, uh, the, the, that was David Chase. The, yeah, when, you, um, when you're doing the, the pilot at AMC, we did not have any money for anybody famous. And going on the air with damages, which had Glenn Close in it, and seeing that it was going to be tough for us to push through this thing. And already, I was kind of like, I want to watch damages. <laughs> Glenn Close is on TV? All right. I got it. And I was like, how are we going to promote this? Like, how are we going to get this, you know? And critics were very helpful. But um, as was the fact that immediately you could talk about things other than how sexy it was or what the plot was and talk about like gender and stuff. That was immediate, immediately a conversation about it, which is my experience was unprecedented in terms of talking about TV, at least in my, my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Maybe after it was off the air, the people read a book about it, but right away, people were saying to me, like, the word gender was being used a lot during the promotion, like gender relations and what, what to change. Right. Um, but uh, I had an experience, which I guess is completely obvious, but I was watching Jerry Maguire, which is a movie that I love and admire tremendously. Um, and Tom Cruise is running through the agency after he's gotten fired, and he falls. And I had a baby at this point, one child, who was asleep in a baby Bjorn. On, I know, I'm the back guy in the movie theater. And I'm standing at the back of the theater just in case something happens so I can run out, but he's out cold. And I got to experience standing at the back of the theater. And when Tom Cruise fell, the audience went, <gasps> and I was like, this director, uh, it's Cameron Crowe, has taken Tom Cruise's movie stardom the same way Henry Fonda in Once Upon a Time in the West, you know, uh, and used it to tell the story here. Because people are like, Tom Cruise fell down. Oh my god, this is the story. Mm -hmm. And you have to, first of all, hope that Tom Cruise is willing to fall down, and he wants to be at that place in his career. Um, because a lot of them are very protective of their, you know, John, of their image. John Wayne, there's like, maybe at the end of his true grit, it's kind of a breakthrough because of that, and the shootist. But for the most part, John Wayne is John Wayne. For me, wanting Owen and Zach and Amy to have, I don't think you've ever seen them done any, do anything like this, to have them start in this comic realm, use their comic chops. It's dialed down a little bit. They can be funnier and broader than this, but we wanted to make it feel like on some level they were real people, especially because the dialogue is elevated, certainly. It's not that many people speak that way. But I love Billy Wilder, so I wanted to stick in, in as much as I could to an elevated tone. Yeah. Well, speaking of, so Zach Galifianakis. Yes. You got him to shave. Yes. Uh, and he looks like Gene Wilder or something, doesn't he? <laughs> I know. He's so handsome. He kind of does. That was always in the story. I didn't know Zach. I didn't know who he was. That is a fake beard. Um, it's the best fake beard I've ever seen. I think it's aided by the fact that we all know him with a beard. Right. So it, you're like, like, oh, it's a guy with a fake beard on. But it is an incredible fake beard. Uh -huh. And he, um, he loved that part of the story. And he also loved being in, in, in his home state of North Carolina and not being recognized. But he's, you know, to me, the idea that he starts taking the medicine and immediately he's not a vegetarian anymore and sort of like straightens up and is indeed a little bit depressed, uh, <laughs> sure. to say the least, but that, that that was the beginning of his sort of like journey back to what he was afraid of becoming, but what is being an adult. Was there also, I mean, that also felt to me as I watched a way to break him out of what we carry in with us. It was amazing to see him like that. I mean, I certainly felt that you, you, can't, you cannot mistake the fact that he has gone straight when you see him come in without that beard. And I also, believe it or not, I mean, I know it's a little bit of a trick on the audience. You do, you do hopefully think that he's going to kill himself. This is... Probably one of the most, uh, I think, accurate depictions of this particular disease, of bipolar uh, disease. And seeing him turn the corner on his fear of losing his mania, which you can't argue with. 
um, it is an extreme state of feeling and it is filled with insight and he says to the doctor, I, I'm a genius. Mm -hmm. And it will go away when the depression hits, but him committing after he's made love to Angela to living, to me that was like, here's, here's a clean start. And I just loved always writing wise that I was going to, to end, you know, work my way up to Steve in, 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 in Ben's arms. Mm -hmm from the beginning, and that they would reverse each other, and Ben would say to Steve, you gotta get your shit together. And you'd see that this is, who, whose life, whose life had, with someone improved. How did you work with them? I was, I was stern, <laughs> um, they, but they were, they were fans of the script. Uh -huh. And they, they liked the story, and they wanted to work with me, and they knew I wanted to work with them. I chased them both down for, you know, Owen was eight years. Um, and I think, uh, they're really, really good actors, and I don't know if everybody knows that, and they will know it if they watch them in this. And Amy, I mean, Amy's just, Amy loved the idea of being Zach's sister, and they both were crazy about that, and she loved the idea of being an adult, and she is such a finely tuned comic instrument. She literally can turn it from broad to, to normal with the same joke. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, you're kind of, because she's a sketch performer, right, right. at her heart which is a rare gift unto itself. But to see that and to not hear the words on the page and to not, to feel the naturalness. And I honestly, directing to me, you, you look at the credits, it's mostly people from Mad Men. I was in a very safe zone, even though we were in North Carolina. Shooting but low budget. What you're used to. Oh, it was much tighter and much, I thought it was gonna be glamorous. And I said in the end, it's always the same. You're in somebody else's living room watching a movie star in a folding chair eating chicken wings off a plate. <laughs> we were just like, you know, you're, you've got cardboard on the floor. It is not, there, there was, we did not, I did not have a personal air conditioning. Um, any of those things that you think is gonna be like, oh, we're making a movie now. Especially an independent movie, you know. Yeah. And it was. It's a true, oh, it's a truly independent film. And that said, uh, I always feel like my job, and this is on Mad Men too, is to be the best possible audience. And you don't really go out there, you kind of are harder on the script. You, you know, I wrote it, so I sort of like divorce myself from that part of it when I'm in there. I know what I want it to sound like, what I always imagined it sounding like. But um, I don't go out there after a take and say, I don't believe you. But you just sort of like say, how about, you know, you just, it's it's actually a completely intuitive it's it like casting itself it's an intuitive experience like writing right you try and get in there and the weird thing is you know it's raining and the, you know you got to you're delayed and you're behind and there's money pouring through the the, the roof you know exactly all of that stuff is kind of on your mind and in the end you're just you're sitting there watching the monitor if you're lucky to have to have a connection with the monitor mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and saying like i think we should do it again <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to ask you about the music of Mad Men and also in here. It yes. seems very important to you. Mad Men always it's very ends important. with a song. Yes. Of um, you know, obviously it's, it was one of the best things in The Sopranos for sure. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that that song at the end of The Sopranos was the thing that made you come back. And it was your time to contemplate. But, uh, and it comes from, I don't even know if it's, Maybe, uh, I was thinking about this the other day, someone asked me about this, Dr. Strangelove. The end of Dr. Strangelove, we'll with the again. bombs going up, we'll meet again. That just the first moment that you see the genius of the irony of a piece of music being put to a, you know, to a story, or you know, honestly, it became the credits of the TV show MASH, but it's, I'm not a huge fan of, of, of the movie MASH, mm -hmm. but that song, well, in I'm that environment, that. Oh, it is just one of those things where you're like, okay, this is, every time there's a, a place for music, I think it cuts through writing, it cuts through everything, and you get emotional about it. And you gotta be careful, because you're also, it's just like a costume. You're telling people what time it is. Sometimes they know the song, sometimes they don't. Um, using this, this piece from Gilbert and Sullivan during the time lapse, which is actually from another movie. It's from Topsy Turvy. Uh, it's a Gilbert and Sullivan piece, and I love Shirley Henderson's version of it. Uh -huh. But it's a little, um, it's their most beautiful song. I feel the passion of her singing it, but there's something really plaintive about it. And it's hopefully telling you right away, 
the relationship between these two guys. I wrote the scene listening to the song. I always imagined that that Steve was the sun and Ben was the moon. Mm -hmm. And you get a connection of their that's that's completely not intellectual. It's goes hopefully goes right through you. And then you know there's things that, that mean something to me. There is a you know, drop kiss me, drop kick me, Jesus, um, Highway sixty one. These are these are biblical songs, and I think that there's something related to there's a, there's a lot of um, somewhat unintentional. It kind of happened, but there is a there is a spiritual element in the in the movie to the point that I always thought that the moment where the Amish guy says to to Amy's character, she says, "What if you don't believe in God?" And he says, "Perhaps that's why you can't have children." I always thought that was there for me to let you know that they were fanatics, that this was like a, that this was like a cult, and that is like the harshest, meanest thing. But it kind of cuts both ways in a strange way. You just realize that she doesn't have anything, right? And the thread in it, my favorite scene in the movie being the one where the Amish kid talks to him. My solution to a story problem of how do I get him to take the medicine? You know, how can you convince a crazy person? Only another crazy person. And I, and and then when I watch it, I'm like, I think maybe that kid does talk to God. Uh -huh. So honestly, Your subconscious. What, whatever, exactly, my <laughs> subconscious. And, and, the, and the, the strange thing about, um, I do believe in God, um, which I know is like, makes me less smart than other people. Um, everybody really smart that I know does not believe in God, but I do. So I'm on that other level. And I think that if nothing else, the humility for, even if it's childish, for believing that there's something bigger than us um, is, is, is curative. Yes. Yes. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> Although, you know, there's aspects of my personality in all these characters. And, uh, I mean, there's no way to avoid it. It opened my eyes to an unsolvable problem that, uh, that family is tired of. They get worn out, and they do not see any romance in it because they have, they have been cleaning up messes. And at the same time, you love this person, and you want to help them. And a lot of what they're saying is true. That's the incredible thing. It, there's a, there's a, 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 a method to it. There's a, a prophetic. It makes you wonder about things that you've read that are prophetic in some way or profound, that you're like, well, this is coming from this part of the brain. But it's. It's not functional. Yeah. And so I was literally trying to say, like, OK, growing up is an unsolvable problem, uh, the same way that mental illness is. And I think that substance abuse is an unsolvable problem. You are always making a compromise, and you are always living in the world of that problem. And everything can be defined by it. And people achieve it, and they move on, and they have productive lives. But it, it, it's, something has changed about them. And that to me is like, that is like the most interesting thing. That is the most dramatic thing that there is in life. When I, when I was approaching Owen and Zach and Amy and saying to them, do you want to play these people, especially Owen and Zach, I'm like, I, I have a script where the characters actually change. And I don't mean like they learn how to commit <laughs> or something, or they find out that they're, they didn't know the strength was in them. They actually change. And is the change permanent? I'm too much of a realist to even weigh in on it. It's kind of beautiful that they get anything good out of it. And that ending, you know, to me is like, you're gonna get, you gotta give something up. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it, I wrote it in, you know, 2005. I feel like it. I watched it happen. I've watched it happen. I've watched us uh, get more and more isolated uh, under the illusion of community. All these things have the word community in them. They are so. As soon as you're having one-sided conversations, I mean, you know what a community is? It's the stock. It's the stock.
when someone is put in the town square and having tomatoes thrown at them, you're in a community. <laughs> when someone is getting poison pen letters, you have a, you know, where we are. It's just like the anonymousness of it. And I think there's an illusion that we're making contact, and you can click like, but it's, it, I don't think it feels like that yet. I hope it becomes something else. And it's not all about the internet. It really isn't. A lot of it is about simple things, you know, that's said in the movie. There was a time when I was able to know what the weather was. I see it with my kids. And now I have no idea. There was, I mean, it's part of what the, the chicken is about. We are so removed from, from this experience. It, it is a terrible thing for us psychically to think that chicken is not an animal. And I don't know if I could do it. And I think that the audience is always shocked. Talk about a tone change, right? You don't see anything, but you're like, this is a commitment. And it's the first honest thing that guy ever did in his life. And damn it if they don't say, great day. It's a miracle and very brave and very honest to do it. And none of us do it. We're just like, let me pull the knob and add the hot water. You know? That's it's because I'm at a party eating a uh, piece of chicken, eating the chicken leg. It, it tastes horrible. It's cooked badly. I throw it in the garbage. And my son looks up to me with these giant eyes and he goes, you know, Dad, that was a chicken's whole leg. <laughs> but it is something alive. And it's not grass. It's a, you know, you'll see when you do it, you feel something. You know that you're, it's, you're, it's a living creature. And I, I kind of want to say, like, well, that's going to turn this guy, that this character that Owen Wilson plays a lot, that's going to change him. On that, we have to say good night. Thank, Thank you, you guys so much. So much a pleasure. pleasure.